Hi, and welcome to Criminal Justice Natters with me, Ed Johnston. I hope everybody had a lovely Christmas and I wish you all a very happy new year. This is our first show of 2021 and we are back with a bit of a bang. We are joined by Laura Narida, who's a clinical professor of law and the co-director of the Centre on Wrongful Convictions based at Northwestern University. Many of you will know Laura from her representation of Brendan Dassey on the Netflix documentary, Making a Murderer. I want to thank you all for submitting your questions uh, for me to ask Laura. Unfortunately, there's a number of things we couldn't cover because obviously the case is ongoing and for legal and strategic reasons, there are a number of things we couldn't discuss. Nevertheless, I think we're going to have uh, an excellent conversation. Um, There has been some technical difficulties during this video and in places the video drops out but the audio is still there so please bear with the but bear with the with the show and um, you can listen to what we have to say. Um, So let's get to it. Hi Laura thanks for joining us today on Criminal Justice Matters. How are you? I'm doing great, Ed. Thanks so much for having me. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for asking. Um, so we'll, we'll jump straight into it because uh, we, I've got a few questions that I, I'd like to get through from what our audience have, have sent in. Um, but the first question comes from me. Why would anyone that's innocent confess to a crime? This is the big question, right? This is what we've we've been asked so many times um, after making a murder, after people saw what happened to Brandon Dassey, how he confessed to a crime that he very plainly did not commit, right? Why would anyone confess to a crime they didn't commit, let alone something as serious as rape or murder, right? Well, it turns out the answer has everything to do with the psychological interrogation techniques that are used inside the interrogation room. And they're used not just in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, but that are used in interrogation rooms across the United States, right? These are psychological techniques that work to turn the world upside down for the person who's being interrogated, right? For the suspect who's there in the box. These are techniques that are very specifically designed to turn the world on its head, to make you think over a period of time that confessing will actually help you um, and that not confessing will hurt you, even if you're innocent, right? I mean, it'll be things like, we know you did this crime. We have all this evidence against you. You're never going to convince anyone that you're innocent. You're only making it worse for yourself if you if you continue to deny your involvement. Um, this goes on, that sort of accusational phase goes on for, for quite some time. Interestingly, in the United States, police are allowed to lie during interrogations about the evidence against a suspect, unlike, of course, in the United Kingdom, where that's been mm-hmm. outlawed, excuse me, outlawed since the 1980s. So, you know, we have police officers coming in and saying, we found your DNA at the scene. We found your fingerprints on the gun. You know, I've got three witnesses in the room next door who picked you out of a lineup. And if even if you're innocent and you're being told this and you don't know the police can lie about evidence, over time you start to think to yourself, my God, there's there's been some horrible mistake in the crime lab or in the investigation process. I don't know what happened, but this police officer, this interrogator really thinks I did this. Mm. And he really thinks there's evidence against me and no one is gonna believe that I'm, that I'm innocent, right? What am I gonna do? That's when police officers are trained at that moment of, sort of hopelessness, right? I'm, I'm trapped. They say there's all this evidence. No one's gonna believe in me. They're trained to offer confession as an out. Right. OK, if you keep denying this in the face of all this evidence against you, um, no one will want to help you. You're going to go down for life. Right. You'll never see your family again. Your life is ruined. Right. But if you do confess, if you cooperate, if you just tell us a little bit more about why you did this or how it went down, people will see that you're not a monster. People will see that you have remorse. People will want to help you and your situation will get better. Right. If you just cooperate and tell us that you did this. Um, that's the choice that people have in the interrogation room. They're reduced down to hopelessness. And then confession is offered as a way out of this hopeless situation. It's incredibly powerful set of techniques. They are really good at getting true confessions, um, but also get false confessions. Yeah. I I was really surprised. Um, Obviously, for someone like Brendan, and I think for 
a huge number of people. A police interrogation is going to be an alien and hostile environment that they're not used to. And what really struck me when watching Making a Murderer that Brendan had no appropriate adult or defence lawyer with him. Um, and, and in England and Wales, that just that that wouldn't be the case. Um, is that commonplace in the United States in terms of no representation in this interview? It is very commonplace. That's exactly right. Of course, in so many places overseas, including England and Wales, there's an appropriate adult when police question a, a, a youth, a, a juvenile, a teenager like Brendan, he would have had somebody in that room to look out for his rights. Um, you guys are 35 years ahead of us. <laughs> On that. <laughs> uh, tragically, it's only in about 13 states in the United States are police required even to try to notify a child's parents before questioning that child. So that means in the vast majority of states, police officers can and do um, question kids all the time without notifying their parents, let alone without getting their parent or lawyer in the room. Um, it's one of the, the biggest areas of needed reform here in the United States. Yeah, I'm, I, I was really shocked by it because you you just think of, of a young man of, of Brendan's age and, and intellect as well. I mean, just what he must have been feeling during there and then being you know, effectively force fed a scenario that didn't happen. Um, For, that's right. I mean, he just, you know, when you think about somebody like Brendan, right, he was 16 years old at the time, of course. He was a special education student with mm -hmm. pretty profound intellectual disabilities, particularly when it came to the way he understood speech and could sort of cope with, with situations involving the spoken word, right? Um, you know, this is a kid who in his, in his high school classrooms, he had to have an adult sit with him in class to mm. help him understand what his teacher was saying. That was his special education accommodation. Yeah. You know, so you take that kid yeah. and you put him in, a, in an interrogation room with two you know, authority figures, right? Police officers, seasoned cops who have questioned many a more, uh, you know, <laughs> serious criminal than Brendan Dassey. Um, he didn't stand a chance in that interrogation room. I'm, I'm only sort of surprised that he held out for as long as he did. Yeah, because uh, it wasn't a short interrogation either. And I, I didn't realize in terms of sort of Brendan's uh, educational adjustments that he would have a member of staff to help facilitate his learning in the room. And you think, well, just listening to that, I was shocked. I was thinking, well, if that's what you have at school to help you learn, why why is that not replicated in this interrogation that, you know, obviously could put put you in prison for you know of an extremely long time um, I find that shocking it's devastating <clears throat> yeah it makes no sense at all it makes no sense that that is the accommodation that his IEP recommended and yeah. instead he was in their funding for himself over the course of four different interrogations that unfolded over a period of 48 hours that's right yeah so in terms of the police not having to notify parents in, in the United States it is that to kind of, you know, th their idea that, well, we can find the truth by simply speaking to this person? Um, we, is, there a, is there a view that having an appropriate adult or a defence lawyer in that room would be some sort of hurdle to, to the, what they're trying to achieve from that process? I think there is a view among some some areas of law enforcement, certainly the sort of more old fashioned areas that haven't caught up to what we've learned from wrongful mm. convictions and false confession cases. There is a view that if you have a parent in the room, certainly if you have a lawyer in the room, that yeah. it will just obstruct the interrogation process. I mean, remember interrogation is this deeply psychological process that is about building this relationship between the interrogator and a person being questioned, where the interrogator's representation of the direness of the suspect's situation has to carry the day, has to be influential, has to be the final word. That's how you get confessions and to have somebody else in there saying, well, maybe you're not going to you know, slow down. What evidence do you yeah. have? I want to see it. Um, that's impossible. It couldn't be so on and so on. That just obstructs this, this psychological dynamic. So the thinking goes. Yeah. Um, and I can understand why. But I mean, um, I, I watch a number of sort of true crime documentaries based on cases in the US. And it always shocks me that um, people are interviewed without the presence of a lawyer and even you know fully grown adults still go in unrepresented is, is that also the norm 
It's absolutely the norm. So in the United States, of course, and you've seen this on, on TV and your true crime documentaries yeah. and, and, and other TV shows. Of course, at the beginning of interrogation, custodial interrogation in the United States, police officers uh, read the suspect, their Miranda rights, right? You have the right yeah. to remain silent, you have the right to a lawyer, uh, all of these things that we all know from TV. Um, that is supposed to be the moment at which, you know, you, the suspect, uh, no, I don't want to talk. I'm going to assert my right to silence or no, I want a lawyer with me during questioning, right? What's fascinating yeah. is how useless those rights are in so many ways, right? 85% of people in the United States waive those Miranda rights. They give up those rights. They say, I, I don't need a lawyer. I don't need to stay silent. I'm, I'm going to talk, right? 85% of people do that. And of course, when you're talking about a child, somebody like Brendan with disabilities, you know, the rates are very abstract. What What is a lawyer, right? How does Brendan Dassey know what a lawyer is? Yeah. Or how to get a lawyer to him in that room or what a lawyer could do for him in that room? You know, it's very abstract. And of course, you know, then layer on the fact that he's innocent. We know from studies of wrongful conviction cases in the U.S. that the number of people who waive, give up those Miranda somebody is innocent, right? Because of course, an innocent person Right, we'll think to themselves, oh, I have nothing to hide. Of course, I'll talk to the police. You know, um, I just want to help. Um, I yeah. just want to show them that I'm a cooperator. And uh, unfortunately for them, once they waive those rights and they begin the conversation, it uh, can spiral downhill from there. Yeah, and that 85% is, um, wow, well, I, I wasn't aware of that figure. That's a shocking figure. In England and Wales, we're roughly about um, just under 50% take the free legal advice in custody mm. in the once you're arrested you, you have a right to a lawyer um and it's about 48 percent of suspects take that um and we have a process where some police station uh, some police constabularies actually actively encourage people to have defense representation because effectively it makes it harder to ref refute any admissions made in there if it's made in the presence of a lawyer um, so to have um, sort of 85 percent without a defense law, I, I find that, that very surprising. Well, I think the difference may have to do, though, with, with the difference between our two countries and the way we understand the right to silence in these yeah. two countries, right? Because here in the United States, if a lawyer comes into the room and says, I invoke my client's right to silence, um, the interrogation must end, right? Um, yeah. And no, no more question no more questioning can occur um, if the lawyer comes in and says that. And I understand that's not always the case in the United Kingdom. It works quite differently there. Yeah, so it, it does. You know, one reason well. why it doesn't happen so much here. Yeah. Yeah. In, in terms of the, uh, in, in terms of being filmed, like carrying out your work on, on Brendan's case, um, how did you cope with sort of just constant cameras around you almost all the time? <laughs> I developed a very good sort of blinker, <laughs> blinker <laughs> approach to my job. You know, it's, um, it's really something, you know, when, when Making a Murderer first came out, right, season one came out in, in late 2015, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, we'd been aware, of course, <laughs> that they had been making this film. Um, they showed up one day in court, which is when we first learned about it. Right? We didn't know that anybody wanted to make a film about this when we first started representing Brendan Dassey. It was only when we were in court with him oh, wow. and the filmmakers showed up with their cameras that we realized, huh, you know, somebody's interested in making this into a film or into a docu-series. Um, but we never really thought it would go anywhere, to be honest, right? A lot of these true crime documentaries, TV shows, docu-series that, that aren't popular. And we thought, well, you know, I mean, let's not get our hopes up, you know, who's, who's going to care about this stuff that happens in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, right? Um, and so when Making a Murderer first came out in, in 2015, first season um, and told Brendan's story to a global audience, right? Right, Millions and millions of accounts watched this thing in the first two weeks alone. Mm -hmm. um, it was absolutely amazing to me to see how Brendan's story lit the world on fire and energized yeah. people, not only to learn more about the case, but to learn more about the justice system. How could this happen? What can I do to prevent it from happening again to others, um, which is something you know, I'll just, I'm so lucky to have been able to see that up close, right? It's like the film comes out and the next day you're 
email inbox and your Twitter account <laughs> are overflowing with people from across the globe who just want to help Brendan. And it's such a beautiful thing, um, incredibly beautiful thing to have been a And I, I think as well, the, the, the idea that, that people were so energized by this. I mean, I had family and friends talk to me about watching this show who have never been interested in any work in criminal justice that I've ever tried to tell them previously and now they're all over it. And um, yeah, I just, I, I just think that that's amazing. Well, that's the incredible thing, right? I mean, it's one thing for criminal defense lawyers or people who are interested in the criminal justice system already to care about this, but that was yeah. the big making a murder moment for those of us who have dedicated our lives to, to improving the system was, you know, everyday folks, ordinary folks across the globe who just sat, sat down on their couch and turned yeah. on a show that seemed interesting on Netflix, suddenly became engaged and suddenly started caring. You know, one of the most amazing things uh, to have come out of Making a Murder, actually, is after Brendan's story got told across the globe, and so many people were, were touched by it, right? You don't have to be a lawyer at all to understand that what happened to Brendan Dassey is wrong. Um, people started writing Brendan letters mm -hmm. from every corner <laughs> of the planet, right? New Zealand, Australia, South America, across the United Kingdom, Ireland, Europe, certainly across the United States, and even from within Wisconsin as well. Um, you know, to this day, he still gets about five letters each day from people wow. across the globe who just want to, you know, write him a short note, hang in there, Brendan, you know, keep your chin up, hold your head high, we believe in you, the truth yeah. will come out, keep on fighting, right? He saves these letters, and um, he writes back to as many people as he can. These are incredible missives of hope from around the globe. They sustain Brendan, they give him hope to have yeah. so many people believing in him. And, you know, when I see that he has hope, that's what gives me hope too. Yeah, and I, that must just be such an amazing feeling for him to to see this belief that sort of transcends the globe almost. Um, it just must be amazing, to, like you say, to get, to have that hope, to keep going. Um, I, I think that I think that's tremendous. Absolutely. I mean, you know, if you think about it, Brennan had been locked up for about eight years by the time Making a Murderer came out, right? Yeah. Um, this was a kid who never had very many friends in the first place because of his disabilities, right? The other kids would make fun of him. Mm -hmm. um, then he was convicted of this and locked away in a cell in the middle of rural Wisconsin and completely forgotten. He was a forgotten person, right? And then um, Making a Murderer comes out, the show comes out seasons one and two, and all of a sudden, people across the planet are saying Brendan Dassey's name and writing him these letters and believing in him and wanting to be his friend and understand where he's coming from and do something, anything to help him or others like him. And um, that's been an absolutely stunningly beautiful result of yeah. the Netflix show, right? Suddenly, Brendan has friends across the globe. Yeah, uh, that, that's amazing. How, how is Brendan doing? Uh, sort of right now or the last time you spoke to him? Yeah, he's he's hanging in there, right? Brendan, of course, was 16 when this happened to him. Um, yeah. He's in his 30s now, yeah. right? So he's grown up behind yeah. bars. He's, he's grown up and missed so many experiences, right? From high school graduation to... to yeah. and that we all go through our process of becoming adults. Um, he's missed out on that. But despite having missed out on so much of his life, spending nearly half of bars, Brennan has grown up into a good man. I mean, he's gentle, he's kind, he is funny. His institution, him, right? He has jobs now behind bars. Um, and his jobs involve taking care of more vulnerable inmates. At his old institution, his job was to push the elderly inmates around in their wheelchairs um, yeah. to take care of them. So he's, he's doing good uh, despite his <laughs> environment of inhumanity. He's doing good in his own way. And I'm very proud of him. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great about Brendan sort of helping people in, in the prison um, whilst he's in there. Does he work in there or is he taking schooling or how does he fill his days? Brendan has got 
Yeah, Brendan has gotten his GED, which is his high school equivalency diploma, right? Um, very proud of him. He's able to wear a cap and gown behind bars, yeah. nonetheless, when he got it. That was a wonderful thing to see. Um, and yes, there, there are jobs available to, to um, those in his prison. And a lot of the jobs Brendan has had, again, involve you know, caretaking, but more vulnerable inmates, the elderly yeah. prisoners, um, people who need somebody to, to just take care of them. Um, tragically as they're locked up in their in their later years of life um Brendan's yeah. somebody that the institution has trusted to do that and he's quite proud that he's been able to help others that way oh that's superb that's, that's really nice to hear that there's some tiny uh sort of semblance of something nice coming from the, this horrific situation obviously it doesn't replace being you know a free man but it sounds like he's making the best of it which is great um, in, in terms of your work, Laura, with the sort of Centre for Wrongful, Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern U University, um, are, are you guys overwhelmed with cases there? Right. So Steve Drizzen and I uh, co-direct the Centre on Wrongful Convictions here at Northwestern University School of Law in Chicago. Um, the Centre has been around for almost 20 years. It's one of the oldest and thankfully most successful innocence organizations in the country. Our colleagues and I have been able to exonerate uh, more than 40 individuals over the course of our history, and we've been able to help secure the release of dozens more people from prisons across, across the country. We operate across the country. Um, but there are only five of us. There are only five lawyers at the Center on Wrongful Convictions. So um, we're only able to help a few people at a time. We yeah. get about 3,500 letters every year wow. from inmates across the, the country who say that they're innocent and are asking for our help with their cases. Of course, we're only able to take a tiny, tiny fraction of those cases. Um, but yeah. when we take a case, we believe in it and we take it for the long haul. Um, some of these cases we know based on our experience, you know, it can take five years, 10 years, 15 years to exonerate people um, because our legal system is so designed um, to elevate closure rather than truth or justice yeah. at times. Um, so the fight can be very long. And of course, we're all seeing that with Brendan's case. Firsthand. Yes. Um, the fight can be very long, but at our center, once we take a case, we take a case. Yeah, that's, that's good. How do you, if you, I mean, 3,500 letters, uh, sort of applications a year, that's a massive amount of cases. How, how do you choose which case to, to, to follow up with? That's a really, really good question, right? And thank God we have a, an army of volunteers who help us process those letters, who help uh, learn more information about um, the, the cases that are sent to us that meet our criteria for acceptance. Um, so it's, it's a process of learning and I would say a process of humility, right? Because when you start looking into these cases more deeply um, and you start seeing that these are cases of teenagers, say, who are spending life in prison based on a single um, testimony of an, uh, based on the testimony of a single eyewitness mm -hmm. who was given a deal in his case in exchange mm -hmm. for pointing the finger and you start saying, well, it doesn't mean that the person is innocent, but that's, you know, let's look a little deeper there, right? Let's look a little deeper. You start seeing these risk factors and recognizing these risk factors as you review cases. Maybe somebody was put in prison based on a confession that looks like Brendan's. Maybe somebody was put in prison based on uh, forensic science from a lab that we know does not use proper forensic standards in evaluating evidence. You start noticing these, these patterns among the cases. Um, and then you dig deeper and you get the trial transcripts and you talk to the original trial lawyers who, who were involved in the case. You know, it's always a good sign, a terrible sign really, but a good sign for what we do when you reach out to somebody about a case they handled 20 years ago, say, you know, do you remember this, this man or this woman, right? Do you remember representing him or her? And the lawyer will say, yes, um, that's the case I've never been able to forget over the course of my career because I yeah. knew they were innocent. Right. Yeah. I mean, those are the cases. When you hear something like that, you stand up and take notice and you just keep investigating with an open mind and digging and digging. And at a certain point, um, you know, you reach a point where it's just staring you in the face. This is a yeah. wrongful conviction. Yeah. Um, 
do you allow students to work on the cases alongside the five lawyers that are there as well? We do. That's one of the joys of operating at a law school, right? Yeah. Um, our students are range in age anywhere from you know mid twenties to around thirty, right? They've all been through undergraduate already. They all have their undergraduate degrees, and they are with us for three years at the law school um, to become lawyers, right? Yeah. Their their law degrees. Um, and after their first year of law school, they're able to work with a group of practicing lawyers who practice out of the law school, right? We're called clinical professors of law because um, we actually handle real cases and we use them to teach the students. Um, not, you know, that law is, is more than those important foundational cases you read in a textbook. It's more than the book of statutes. It's more than the book of rules. It's real mm -hmm. people and, and it's systems that regulator and I, I suppose <laughs> it, I suppose as well from um, from a student's perspective this sort of real life experience um, just be invaluable to you know a life in in criminal defense or you know rectifying miscarriages of justice I mean it, it just sounds superb from a, from a, from a student perspective um, I think it's really well done well well, let me tell you a quick story on that front, um, because that was my experience, right? 15 years ago, 16 years ago, maybe maybe a little longer than that. <laughs> I was a law student myself here at Northwestern, here at Northwestern University. I was in the law school. I'd gone through most of law school. Um, I was in my last year, and I thought I had my life figured out. I was going to be a, a a commercial litigator, right? Somebody okay. who who writes contracts, because people when the contracts fall apart, and all of these things. And on a complete whim, I signed up for Steve Drizzen's class on wrongful convictions. He was a professor at the law school. Um, you know, I knew nothing about the criminal justice system. I knew nothing about wrongful convictions. I certainly knew nothing about false confessions. But I signed up for this class, figuring, you know, let's try something off the beaten path before I graduate. Um, and I remember it really well. It was a few weeks into the fall semester of my last year of law school. Steve, my professor then, called me into his office. This is about four months after Brendan Bassey had been convicted at trial. Mm -hmm. And he said, I've just been asked to represent on appeal this 16-year-old kid from Wisconsin who confessed to a murder that I don't think he committed. And he handed me, you know, I'm a total blank slate. He handed me the interrogation videos of Brendan yeah. Bassey, the same videos that would end up in making a murder so many years later. Um, and there I was, law student. I, I took these videos home and I put them into my laptop, these DVDs, and I yeah. watched them all from start to finish. And my heart broke, right? Yeah. Um, because I could see these two seasoned adult interrogators manipulating this frightened child into confessing to a murder that he couldn't even describe. Um, and that changed my life. That was something I knew I couldn't walk away from. Um, from that day on, <laughs> all my plans to be a, a commercial litigator went out the window, <laughs> thankfully. I came back after graduating <laughs> to yeah. Northwestern and have been working alongside Steve at the Center on Wrongful Convictions ever since then, um, representing oh Brendan and also fighting for many, many others just like yeah. him. So that's a very long winded way of saying, yes, this experience of working alongside real lawyers, fighting real injustice in law school, it can. It can be life changing. It was for me. Oh, that, that's an amazing story. Uh, and what an experience as a student to sort of be handed, you know, this case that turned out to be this massive as well. Um, yeah, that, that's an excellent story. As we well, come back on. And thankfully, you know, to, yeah, and thankfully, of course, to work on it alongside Steve and a lot of other more seasoned lawyers. When I was when I was just beginning, you know, it was a learning experience for me that I'll never forget. And, and then to yeah. see, of course, my sort of transformative eye-opening moment replicated on the world stage when yeah. when people around the globe saw those same videos on the, you know so many years later and were similarly appalled disturbed energized motivated whatever the right word is it, it was really something yeah. to to watch my own you know individual experience played out on, on a huge scale another thing that shocked me from um season one of making a murderer if you think about sort of you know the, the thoughts of what a defense lawyer should do you know they're, they're a zealous advocate for for their client they're going to advance the client's best interests 
And then you see um, Brendan's original lawyer, Len Chizinski, and how he just, well, flew in the face of those sort of central tenets of what a defence lawyer should do. Um, I mean, I don't know if you if you want to, to, to talk about that, but I mean, just the lack of sort of zealous representation, um, not only in court, but then with that, with the, you know, selling up the, the, the polygraph test as, as well. It's absolutely horrifying, right? What, um, what happened during the course of Brendan's first representation was something I'd never seen before, something none of us on the team had ever seen before, right? It wasn't just lack of zealous representation. It was that Brendan's first attorney, as we argued in court, was, was just disloyal to him, was actually acting in a way it, with the hope of, of proving Brendan's guilt. And of course, when you've got an innocent client, that means you've got to coerce your clients into, into admitting guilt, which is exactly what we all saw on that video, right? When, yeah. when the defense investigator on the case came to visit Brendan in jail and gave him the polygraph, and mm -hmm. lied to him about the results, lied to him, told him he failed it, um, and told him that he had to make a statement, uh, again, admitting guilt, or else Brendan's defense team wouldn't help him, that they would walk yeah. away from him. You know, it's, it's shocking. It is sort of unprocessably shocking that happened. It is deeply unprocessably shocking that it all happened and they taped it, right? That yeah. we have a videotape of this. It's the kind of story that if I told you this is what they did, you'd never believe me if Absolutely, it wasn't videotaped, yeah. right? Um, yeah. you, know, you know, when we first saw that tape, our, our mouths, our jaws hit the floor. Um, poor Brendan. Imagine you're him. Imagine you're 16. Imagine you've just gone through this this brutal set of interrogations. You've just admitted to the most locally high-profile murder. <laughs> um, you've been demonized in the press. You've been demonized on a TV press conference by the prosecutors. You've been thrown in a prison cell, taken away from your family, taken away from your school, taken away from everything you know. And this is the guy that they send in to help you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's 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 disturbing. It's disturbing and should never be allowed to happen if you and I, I i i've i've asked a number of guests this particular question and there isn't one easy answer uh but if you could change one element to sort of improve almost almost overnight the criminal justice process what what would be the one thing that you you would focus on that, that need would need immediate reform i think it's almost <laughs> almost an unanswerable question because yeah. immediately my head is flooded with like 70 <laughs> things that need to be changed you know, 10 years ago. Right? Yeah. Um, but, but I do have hope for reform on, on so many levels. Um, I think that we need to make the clemency process more effective, more of a safe start against miscarriages of justice that happen in our system. And I think there are real conversations right now about making the clemency power more robust at the federal level, giving some actual um, power, some actual bite to this uh, to this tool, this very underused tool that we have in our system. I think there's also energy right now for the first time uh, to to amend or repeal EDPA, which you know those of you who watched season two mm -hmm. of Making a Murderer will remember as this draconian law that prevents federal courts from overturning even obvious injustices in the state court system. I think yeah. there's real energy around getting rid of that law now. That's really important to do, an absolute priority. Um, and then there's other things, right? Right now, um, only 27 states in the United States require interrogations to be electronically recorded. Why? So 23 states right now, you know, Brendan could be taken behind closed doors inside the interrogation room, kept there for hours, and he comes out, and you have no record of what they said or did to get him to confess. Right? That's yeah. still the case in 23 states. That's an easy reform. It's about transparency. It benefits everybody, right? And, and yeah. that's an important reform. Um, but something that I'm actually, the last one I'll mention that I'm really excited about is for the first time in the United States, a bill has been introduced in New York State to outlaw lying about the evidence in interrogations. Yeah. Right? There was just an op-ed in the New York Times a few days ago by the exonerated five, right, formerly known as the Central Park Five, the, the five defendants in the infamous 
Central yeah. Park jogger case who falsely confessed to this um, attempted murder back in the 1980s. Um, they, of course, were exonerated by DNA and have come out in, in, in vociferous support of this effort to outlaw lying about the evidence during interrogations. I can't tell you what an important reform that yes. will be um, to just, you know, to, to build a foundation of honesty and integrity in the interrogation room and in the policing world. Uh, that's what we need. That's what we need to do. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's a great one. One that I, I'm always interested in when I speak to uh, lawyers in the US is sort of, sort of, the amount of discovery or disclosure that's given to um, the lawyer and and or the suspect if you if you're not represented um, in advance of, of the interview do you, do you guys get a, a good deal of information beforehand or is it all very uh, kept close to the officer's chest it varies very widely across the united states some jurisdictions are better about disclosing evidence and others are not but if I can generalize for a moment, you know, you're absolutely right that that's a critical area of reform here. Um, I can't tell you how many cases I've seen, how many wrongful conviction cases I've seen where somebody spends a decade or two decades, 25 years in prison, finally is exonerated by DNA or some other new reliable evidence. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of a civil lawsuit that follows, that's when you get your first glimpse into really what the police and prosecutors have in their files. It's only during yeah. the civil process. All of these documents that weren't turned over earlier, all this evidence of innocence, um, all of these, you know, these pieces of the puzzle that could have been used to save this person's life 25 years earlier. Um, we see this happen over and over and over again. And that is a very crucial area to rethink under the law. Absolutely. How can you defend your client if you don't have all the information? It's very basic. Absolutely. When I teach my my students um, the sort of rules governing disclosure, um, I sort of liken it to an idea that you, you go to a hospital and you need surgery um, and the surgeon doesn't know what's wrong with you. So they're just going to start doing stuff to you. It would never happen. Um, so how is a defense lawyer supposed to defend you um, or advise you as to plea or any legal advice without a full picture of the facts? Um, I think it's something that we need. That's more absolutely right. Here. Yes, yes, I agree. You know, yeah. honesty is the best policy, right? Truthfulness, absolutely. disclosure, openness. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's crucial. Absolutely. Uh, I've just got a couple of questions, and then then I will will let you go. Um, to the last two questions: is, is there a rough time frame in terms of what's going to? happen next with Brendan without going into detail? Sure, sure. Well, of course, you know, we're still representing Brendan um, as we have done for so many years. And we are as committed as ever to um, watching Brendan walk out of those prison doors one day and, and as committed as ever to making sure that day comes as soon as humanly possible. Um, so yes, Brendan still has options to pursue Right, he still has the ability to file a post-conviction petition. Um, someone in his position can do that still, right? Bring new evidence before the court. Um, and someone in Brendan's position also can return to the governor of Wisconsin and seek clemency a second time. Of okay. course, we filed a clemency petition with the governor of Wisconsin on Brendan's behalf about a year and a half ago, about a year ago now in October of 2019. Um, and we had high hopes, we were joined in our efforts by people across the globe, hundreds of thousands who signed a petition to yeah. free Brendan, along with, with thousands from within Wisconsin itself. We were joined by 250 experts, right? Everybody from former prosecutors to senators to psychologists wow. to formerly incarcerated people, right? People who themselves falsely confessed. Um, we were even joined by Kim Kardashian, <laughs> yeah. who, who, who saw our effort to free Brendan and very graciously um, tweeted about it and posted on her Instagram and elevated the issue for which we were very grateful. Um, yeah, that's amazing. It was an incredible effort. And unfortunately, the governor denied that clemency petition very unceremoniously without even reviewing our petition on the merits wow. just a few days before Christmas 2019. Um, we are barred from reapplying until this summer. Um, okay. But, but uh, rest assured, we continue to work very hard um both publicly and and very much behind the scenes as well okay well that, that sounds good and I, I i keep everything crossed and i'm sure 
everybody does that, that justice is eventually done in in this case uh, my, my my final question is just about the sort of explosion of these sort of true crime documentaries do you think do you think that there's been a benefit in maybe opening the wider public's eyes into how criminal justice is carried out I do, I do, and it's something I think about a lot, right? Having had a, a very unexpected <laughs> front row seat to the phenomenon yes, of the explosion yeah. of true crime documentaries. Um, I've seen this before, you know, I before um, before there was Netflix, right? Um, yeah. Steve Drizzen and I worked, we were part of a larger team of lawyers who worked on the West Memphis Three case down in Arkansas, which is another sort of globally famous case. There'd been a series of documentaries made about it uh, through HBO, and Peter yeah. Jackson, uh, the filmmaker from New Zealand, also made a film okay. about it. Uh, so years and years ago, we saw the power of documentary film, of storytelling um, in, 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 this, in this space. I mean, if you think about it, right, when you, when you push back against this dominant narrative, right, a dominant narrative has been told about who Brendan Dassey is or who the West Memphis Three are. Um, it's been told by prosecutors and police. It's been told by the, by the court system. It's been told in newspapers and press releases and press conferences and the evening news reports. And it's a very scary narrative about this person being evil. We have to have some way to push back against that narrative in order yeah. to allow judges um, just the, the, the sort of mental space to reconsider these cases fairly and carefully and without having to contend against this, this wrong but dominant public narrative. And that's the value I see in these true crime documentaries, right? Whether it's Making a Murderer or The Staircase or, or the, the shows that are made about the West Memphis Three or the Serial Podcast um, yeah. or even the podcast that Steve and I now host on False Confessions, right? If you, if you, if you allow people to, to reconsider, give them the space to think, you know what, maybe that thing I was, was told, maybe people got it wrong. Um, that's of enormous value. Um, it's just an incredible thing to see for our clients, for the people who've been wrongfully convicted, and for the hope of reform in the future. Because as you well know, there are legions of folks around the globe now who are advocating in their own ways for reform here in the United States, but also at home in their own countries. People who've educated themselves after watching these shows, who've written their lawmakers, who talk to their neighbors about what needs to change, who have become active citizens in the pursuit of justice. And I think that's a remarkable, remarkable phenomenon that I, I'm very proud to have been a, a small part of. Absolutely. It is fantastic. And on that note, is there anything that the wider public can do to help Brendan's case? Or is it a case of just keep going on with the petitions in doing what they're doing already? I'm so glad you asked. You know, the most important thing that people can do to support Brendan Dassey is to keep on saying his name, right? To keep on talking about what happened to him, to keep on telling your, your friends or your family members or your neighbors, hey, I haven't forgotten about this kid. Have you heard about what happened to him? He's still in prison. He's not a kid any longer, right? Keep talking about it. Keep posting on social media. Um, keep organizing your own communities around reform. Um, keep writing letters if that's what you did, or maybe if you haven't done that yet, but you find yourself with an, with an extra 10 minutes of time, right? Maybe this coming weekend. Think of Brendan, because those letters, they support him so much. They sustain him so much. You can find his address on the website of the Oshkosh Correctional Facility in Wisconsin, which is where he's, he's housed. Um, if folks want to educate themselves more, that's great too. There are so many wonderful books and films and TV shows about the criminal justice system now that people can read about how this happens over and over and over and what we can all do about it, right? Um, so go out there and watch those shows, read those books. Um, you can find reading lists on the Innocence Project's website, on other websites of, of great ways to get educated. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, finally, just get involved, right? Get involved. There are incredible organizations across the globe who do the good work of fighting for innocent people. Uh, without charging them money, right? Ours is one center on wrongful convictions. We represent all of our clients pro bono and rely on outside support to do that. There are other incredible organizations that do the same or similar work, the Innocence Project, Amnesty International, whatever the case may be. Find out who's active in your community. Um, get supporting them, get involved, and uh, 
You know, it's, this is a huge fight. It's a huge fight that is so much larger than just those of us who are lucky enough to be the lawyers who, who get to stand up yeah. in court. It is a much larger fight than us. It's a fight that is shared by every single person on the globe who cares about justice. So get out there and fight. We're doing the same thing. And uh, let's, let's do this together. Let's bring Brendan home. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time this evening, Laura. It's been a really illuminating chat. And um, I, yeah, thank you for giving up your time to, to talk to me. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. Well, thanks, Laura, for such an interesting talk. Um, it, the case obviously sparks emotions with everybody who's seen it. Um, I want to thank you for giving up your time to speak to me this evening. And um, that, that's greatly appreciated. And I wish you the best of luck. And I will be following the outcome of Brendan's uh, case uh, with, with a close eye and fingers crossed that everything goes well. Again, viewers, apologies for the technical difficulties we had, but hopefully it doesn't detract from the quality of the conversation that, we, that Laura and I had. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. And will join me again uh, next week.